I mean, I just kept a few links there, but I'll, I'll try and embellish them a little bit and republish later. Um, right. So I guess the, the big headline was that MicroPython 123 got released. Um, so uh, that took us a little longer than expected, but um, on the very last day of May, it went, went out the door. Uh, and Damien's already demonstrated one of the biggest features, which is the dynamic USB stuff. Um, but it also had open AMP support. We've talked about this a little bit in previous months. But, um, there was a lot that ended up going into the release. It was sort of started off as, as being what we thought might be a, a smallish release, but um, uh, a few other things got added to it. Um, so yeah, I'm sure many of you have already checked it out, but go do check it out. There's, there's a very long list of um, changes and release notes that you can go through and see what's happened. Um, lots of bug fixes. Yeah, lots of stuff that went into it. Um, and as I said there, like, yeah, development doesn't pause. Version 1.24 is uh, is already uh, in development. Um, and there's some really interesting features there um, that I'm looking forward to. Um, we'll talk about that next time. Viper IDE uh, was a really interesting release too from uh, Volodymyr, uh, who's the co-founder of Blink, which I, I didn't realize, but um, Blink's a, an IoT uh, cloud sort of system to manage um, devices sort of in the wild. Uh, and uh, Vladimir had been playing with MicroPython and figured that we needed uh, an in-browser IDE, and that's what Viper is. Um, so it's built around Chromium browser because it uses web USB and, and web Bluetooth to establish connections to your devices. But yeah, it presents a file system um, of the files on the device. Uh, it lets you install, like MIP install things from the browser. as you edit the files in quite a neat, kind of editor and it has a ripple um, that's running. What more could you want? Um, I think as, as I mentioned here, I think it's particularly fantastic in the education space for Chromebooks um, where you can't necessarily install anything. So um, really neat uh, solution from Vladimir. Uh, have a really quick look at it. I'm running Firefox at the moment, but you'll get an idea for what it looks like. Um, and it's quite a slick sort of UI. Um, Les Pounder, who's one of the key journalists at Tom's Hardware, interviewed Vladimir as well, and he talked about Viper ID, ID and, and Blink, and uh, and, a, and he also uh, showed off a, a MicroPython library to connect to the Blink system, so it looks like he's playing a fair bit with MicroPython. PyCon AU, um, a call for proposals has gone out, so this is in November in Melbourne, um, so... There's a bunch of us that will be going to PyCon AU, I'm sure. Uh, I, I intend to put in a proposal. Um, uh, we've got until the 21st of July. So it's before the next meetup. So I won't have a chance to remind you again. So put it in your calendar. Make sure you put in a proposal if you're at all interested. It's a, it's a, the PyCons are really good to, to present at. So really quite a gentle introduction if you haven't done so before. Really well organized. Um, yeah, they give you a lot of assistance. Um, great, great place to talk at. Uh, there's there's three conference tracks uh, apart from the main one this year, education, scientific Python, and DevOps. Um, so anything to do with DevOps, especially things that have gone wrong. Um, I'd say most of the MicroPython stuff would fall into the main conference track um, this year, which is fine. Uh, we also might run a, a development sprint with MicroPython if there's, if there's enough interest. Um, we usually try and uh, put aside a day perhaps after the main event um, of PyCon AU uh, where people can just get together and, and hack away on, on MicroPython in various ways. So that's, um, that's coming up in November. Uh, speaking of conferences, there was the Teardown Conference, which is run by Crowd Supply. Um, it's more of a hacker-friendly conference, I suppose. Um, yeah, they have all sorts of interesting things uh, where they're ripping apart devices and figuring out how they work and reverse engineering and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Ned Cons uh, posted uh, on the discussion forum that uh, he was talking about um, MicroPython going from product prototype to product, um, and how you know, there's a bunch of benefits to doing so. Uh, I, I looked at, uh, at Ned's uh, presentation and gave him a little bit of feedback, and they're, they're really good. So um, I'm, I haven't heard yet how he went, um, but hopefully it was good. Uh, I'm looking forward to a video. They usually come out uh, like a month later. Uh, Dr. Simon Monk, who's a pretty uh, prolific author in, in various topics, um, has released a book on 
uh, using the ESP32 with MicroPython. Uh, it's available on Amazon only at the moment, but he wants to release it on his own site as well. Um, and he was good enough to uh, send me through a, a link that allowed us to buy it from Amazon uh, via an Australian. I don't, I don't know how the source works, but the main link wouldn't allow me to buy it in Australia. So um, there's a link here. This one actually does work for Australian um, people based in Australia. It's a bit pricey. Um, as in the Australian link is pricey. It's like double the price, like $20, 20 something dollars. Um, so it's a really um, pretty affordable sort of book if you're looking at um, programming the ESP32 with MicroPython. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, so I'll give you more of a review next time. Uh, Kev McAleer is... Yeah, continues to release great videos. This one's on um, uh, coding old retro uh, basic programs, but in MicroPython. So brought up this old, it's quite a popular uh, old school 80s book, um, which has a whole bunch of programs. And uh, he looked at um, coding those on on uh, the Raspberry Pi Pico uh, using MicroPython. Uh, quite a fun video. Check it out. I was meant to be getting some WaveShare hardware. Um, but I got a delivery notification saying that they couldn't deliver it to me. And apparently they tried a couple of times. Uh, I'm still waiting for it to arrive. So hopefully next month I'll, I'll be able to talk about that. In the meantime, Lilygo have been releasing stuff. Uh, here's two of them. One of them is a tea glass, which is definitely a, a, has a hacker vibe going on. Uh, it's a little thing that you attach to the side of a set of glasses. Uh, ESP32 S3 based. Um, it's got a little sort of prism in it. Um, fairly, yeah, fairly small, but it's got all the bits and pieces you need. So if you want to experiment with that field, um, looks like a fun way to get into it. Forty-one dollars, pretty cheap for a development kit like that. Apparently, the glasses come with it as well. I guess they've got no lens in them. Um, yeah. Uh, the other one was the T Encoder Pro, another one of these uh, rotary encoders with a circular display on the front. Uh, again, looks quite powerful. SP thirty two S three. Tons of flash and RAM, uh, neat little display on it. Uh, Thirty-three dollars. They have some other things uh, that, that was in, that may be interesting to you. Uh, we can have a really quick look. I'll just go over them really quickly. But the TQT, I thought people might like. It's a C six. Um, it's quite a small little display. Um, looks like you can mount it to your bike really easily. Uh, and the T-Camera Plus S3, I thought some people here might be interested in. Uh, not to mention the cellular little device they've got, which is battery powered, and another one which is also battery powered. So if you're looking, if those look interesting, they were all released in the last month, and you can see that yeah, quite a few of them are already sold out. They do refresh pretty quickly though, so yeah. Uh, what else we got? In five stack, the other one, the other group who keep releasing stuff um, have the Core S3 SE, which I don't know who, which genius chose that, the S3 SE. It's hard enough to say, but alone look at. Um, but this is kind of the cut down version of the Core S3 that they released a while ago, which is quite a bit fatter. It was like double the thickness, and it had a built in um, uh, DIN connection on the back, on the sort of on the back of it with a battery. Uh, this one's kind of a, a cut down version. It drops a few things, like it has a doesn't have the camera or a proximity sensor, and um, but it's got most of the other th bits and pieces you need. Um, great display on it. Um, again, another ESP32 S3, which have obviously been really popular and fairly affordable, $39 for what you get. That's pretty amazing. You know, a whole bunch of hardware in there. Uh, we've been tracking the MicroPython on the Playdate for a little while now. Uh, this was just a, a quick one to say that Christian Wolf has released uh, his first... Uh, the first release of his library, which allows you to run Pew Pew games, which is what they've been sort of trying to get. The, Pew Pew is like a library that uh, allows you to write fairly simple sort of games. Uh, Radomir Dobrowski and uh, Christian have been trying to, uh, have been working on those for quite some time. Um, this little library allows you to run the Pew Pew games pretty much on top of the, the Playdate uh, hell, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, I think he released his first game. Which is pretty cool. Uh, it's a little bit, there's a, there's a few little corner cases that are still trying to work through. So um, I expect a, a V.2 soon. 
And Lawrence, if you're here, you can quickly talk about your um, Billy library. I think you so, had to drop off. I had to drop off? No worries. Um, so this is Lawrence, of course, is the, one of the Pybricks guys. Um, he's released a, a specific library to work on all of the um, the Pybricks that support BLE comms. Uh, this is Michael Python BLE Radio. And, and it works um, in an interesting way. He wanted to make it uh, simple to use. And, and the whole idea here is just using the BLE advertising packets. So rather than pairing with devices, it, it tries to use as much of the um, very small amount of, of memory you've got to work with the advertising packets and to connect um, whatever devices you want to, to do things. So uh, just by bringing devices sort of close together, you can get them to, to communicate. Quite a neat um, solution here. Uh, and no reason it's not constrained to Pybricks. We could use it uh, in any MicroPython uh, system. MP Display by Brad Barnett. Brad's been working on MicroPython and LVGL for a little while. And so this was like a, um, this MP Display library started as a way to um, bridge that gap a little easier, but it kind of got a little bit bigger. And so now it's a, it's a display and event driver that works on a, a bunch of Pythons, C Python, CircuitPython, and MicroPython, uh, and allows you to sort of render things in the, um, like on the Unix build, uh, and then push it to a hardware device, which is um, looks really interesting. It's got a lot of promise. Still some rough edges, but Brad's been pulling together a whole bunch of different libraries to sort of uh, get the best of a lot of worlds, like frame buff derived systems. And um, yeah, I think it's one to watch. I think if we can, if anyone's got interesting rendering graphics, um, please do chip in and have a look at the discussion post and have a look at, at Brad's library. Uh, it looks really quite interesting. I'd love to see this go a little further. Uh, Tim Tim Hanowich, who talked a couple months ago on his uh, quadcopter, uh, has been playing with MicroHyzen again uh, with rendering monochrome videos. I don't know how this will work um, over the communication link, but uh, these are just monochrome videos on the on that uh, the popular SSD 1306 display, uh, and he's looked at different ways to encode these videos and play them back, and they, they're playing back pretty well. Um, all us nerds will probably recognize the opening sequence of Star Wars. Uh, he's got a few of these. He's also been looking at using um, a Delta encoding as well. So at the moment, um, I think these are full frame encoding. Um, but yeah, really, really smushing down that those file sizes so they play back on these small devices pretty easily. Um, and I think sort of as a, an extension of that, or I think bit graphics came first. This is a library that you put together for displaying images and text on the 1306. Um, so you can see this is uh, just a way of uh, loading sort of images easily. And again, bit graphics works on it kind of on C Python as well as MicroPython. And on the C Python, Python side, you can load like JPEGs and bitmaps using Pillow and then compress it down to something that can run on bit graphics, but on the MicroPython side uh, in, in a, in a size efficient sort of way. So it's quite nice. Uh, Alessandro Getty, uh, Damien, I don't know if you wanted to talk about this at all, but while you're here, but uh, Risk Five has had a couple of interesting additions in the last month. So, uh, uh, Well, yeah, just as it says here, the native code emitter, so you can do at micropython.native and at micropython.viper and for Risk Five, We haven't yet enabled it on ESP32C free but i guess that will come shortly um and also it would be great eventually to have like inline assembler for risk five yeah it hasn't it hasn't popped out that, that does yeah. not exist yet yeah. so <laughs> that yeah but what, what is there is great and a, a qemu risk five port as well to test out and run it under ci and everything so i think risk five will start playing more and more of a role um in microcontrollers that's good. This one, I don't know a lot of, thanks, Dan, thanks. Um, this one, I haven't followed very much, but there's a really good write-up on um, and a really compelling title when a mongoose met a MicroPython. Uh, mongoose was an MQTT embedded library by Sasanta, and uh, they basically wrote MicroPython wrappers so that you can access the MQTT library. So you're kind of getting the advantage of the performance there. Oh, change, wrong, 
image here. Um, so yeah, that's it's a really good one if you want to look at how to do uh, uh, like a C user module that interfaces directly with quite a deep and complex um, uh, C library. I've messed up the, the image here, but uh, this was framed up for the console. Maybe I can change it. Um, I'll just describe it. Uh, in fact, I think we might even have an image here. So Owen's uh, put together, it's a, it's a frame buff derived driver. Um, and so this is kind of the gist of it here. Uh, instead of actually running to a, a regular 1306, 1306 was flavor of the month, this, this month. Uh, those little device, those little displays are really popular. Um, but you can swap out the regular driver for one of these ones and then render what the what would go to the display normally. So when you hit show, it'll just render some texture, textual output. So you don't need the hardware. You can all do all this in the, on the Unix build and so sort of have a rapid um, iteration cycle. Um, we also started talking about different ways of extending this concept where you could render it to um, an HTML canvas or um, perhaps an SDL canvas so you could... Um, have it look a bit better um, and try to make it a bit more generic than having to switch out the whole driver. But even as it stands, I think this is useful if you're in that space where you want to use one of those displays. Uh, Mike Python is a TC32. This is a terrible watch. Um, and that's what David Given says in this video. The opening line is literally, I have a new watch, it's terrible. Uh, it cost him three dollars, I think, or three euros. I didn't quite catch which which denomination it was in. Um, it says three dollars, but I'm not convinced. Anyway, a very cheap watch. Uh, it has a, a cap, uh, no, a, a very simple sort of touch button on the bottom, simple little um, color display, and not a lot else. There's a fake heart rate monitor in it. Um, yeah. Anyway, David's got an excellent video um, where he talks about dissecting one of these things and eventually getting MicroPython running on it. Um, and it uses this obscure microcontroller, the TLS, um, TLS R8232. Plenty of flash, but only 16K of RAM, which is really tight. Uh, it does actually have BLE. He hasn't added BLE yet because um, he's got about 10K of RAM spare when he starts. Uh, and the BLE library takes about 10K of RAM. So he's not sure what's going to happen there. Um, probably just won't use BLE. Uh, but yeah, he's been able to render to the display through, with MicroPython um, and access most of the peripherals that this, this kind of little thing has. Um, got popular enough that, and the video is really compelling to watch, really interesting seeing it all. Um, made it to the front page of Hacker News. So, uh, there's some interesting discussion there too. Uh, the ESP32C6 port, Andrew, I noticed you fixed the ADC issue the other day, which I think was the last known feature that we have. So um, this will Just be to clarify, good. I didn't fix it. A fix was submitted where, is, as, okay. by a pull request to my fork, which oh, is uh, my branch, which is very, yeah, very much appreciated. Right, so I haven't quite finished testing it. There has been an, a different bug reported via a discussion post. Uh, I think it's possibly more in the IDF, like uh, the C6 crashing out hard on Wi-Fi connection. Uh, yeah, haven't right. been able to confirm whether that's, that's to problem. do with our integration or IDF being new for C6 in general. Yeah, right, okay. A little bit more testing to go there, but in general, it seems to be working pretty well. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know if you know this, but um, I didn't realize that this little cheapo thing, well, meant to be, it's meant to be like on the low end side for the espresso range, but they have integrated um, CAN for this too. So um, Gus, who some of you may know, is working on CAN for the next release or two. I'm not sure if it'll make it into 124, but um, CAN is on the radar for MicroPython. Um, and just to clarify, we have got can support in the STM32 port, but um, this would give it, this would provide an API that would be consistent across all ports. Um, so that's definitely on the radar. It would be nice to add it to this little thing. If I can jump back in. Please. <laughs> it just happened I was yeah. testing the C6 um, before you brought it up. Uh -huh. And because I wanted to test if that crash still happened on the recently submitted IDF or released 5.2.2, 2. 
turns out it compiles just fine and I've connected to my Wi-Fi just fine on it with the same sample code that crashed on 521. So there's a positive step forward. So you're blaming Espressive? Yep. Okay. Uh, 521 was the very first release that supported C6 at all. So yep. a few teething issues are to be expected and it looks like they've improved things and cleaned up in 522. So great steps forward, I'd say. And this might mean that C6 pull request is ready for review and testing, um, probably yeah, on caveat of 522 being the idea of recommendation. Yeah, cool. It's been added to the milestone for 124, so we're hoping to get this in for the next release. Um, yeah. It's a compelling little little board. Um, there's also some, been some discussion, there's a couple of discussion posts on how we integrate matter and thread uh, in the MicroPython world, so this chip might be used for that too. Skip over this because I've been working on these for a little while, but uh, the card pewter is the other one that I've been looking at. So uh, getting a, a proper board definition for the card pewter, um, just a crazy little M5 stack board. Um, but yeah, if you do have a chance, <laughs> sorry, Andy, I, I will get a board definition soon. Um, I just haven't had a chance to do the keyboard. I've done the display integration. So um, you can use OS dot, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Dupe REPL? No. Lost my, lost my train of thought. There's a way to duplicate the REPL um, and so I can, I can get the REPL to appear on that little screen. I haven't yet integrated the keyboard so that it also um, interacts with the REPL. Um, but I have gotten it so that you can detect the key presses. So halfway there. Uh, there was a few things on this last month. Uh, the caravan motorhome level, that's the complete wrong image as well. Sorry, I've skipped a couple of things. Um, but this gives you the idea. The Luke Volders had a project to make a device to help make sure his caravan and motorhome was level. And he had a really cool six-part blog write-up on it. And the idea here is that he's got like a MicroPython device with a um, accelerometer or um, some sort of device that can detect levelness. <laughs> Um, and it's in this little box and he puts that in his uh, caravan and motorhome and then he can take his phone out um, outside, look at the uh, level of the, of, the, of the car and then use the jacks to appropriately set it nice and level. Um, so yeah, interesting little breakdown, worth a, worth a look. The image that is correct here is Walid's uh, Ultimate open source smart sit stand desk. Uh, try saying that three times fast. Uh, this guy, Wiley, I hadn't come across him before, but he's put together an exquisite video, really. Uh, it's beautifully done, talking about the whole build that he went, where he went from a broken manual IKEA desk uh, and motorized it and made MicroPython firmware available and built the whole 3D um, package around the electronics um, and made a, a really nice smart sit stand desk. Uh, obviously put a lot of time and effort into it and the video uh, is really pretty and, and nice to watch. Um, really good quality. Uh, and he's also got all the, the firmware available. So if you, he also has requested feedback on it too because I think this is his first MicroPython project. Um, and yeah, it's worth, worth a watch. I didn't get to get this, the, um, the image of John's uh, balance droid. But I'll take you to John Highland's active in the Discord channel, uh, and he's building a balance droid. Uh, I thought there was an image of it there, but maybe it's in here. It's just a bit slow. That's the balance droid that he's designed. Oh boy! Uh, and he's trying to get this to be a self-standing um, droid with MicroPython. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of project bit of activity uh, in the Discord channel. Go check it out. Uh, Finals, it's Meetup is <laughs> Meetup is rated bad, and uh, this is a problem today. I couldn't, I still can't update the Meetup um, event. Uh, it's just, I just get an error every time I try to save the changes. Uh, so if we've got any alternatives out there, uh, please hit me up. Uh, I want to move away from it. It's a pain in the neck. Uh, it's not the first time that Meetup's bitten this, and it's not cheap. It's uh, it's over a hundred dollars. Every six months, and uh, 
George Robotics, like Damien's company, covers most of that. Um, but it's still, it's it we doesn't feel like we're getting good value. It got by uh, yeah, bought by Bending Spoons. Uh, it's actually gone through a number of hands. I think Bending Spoons is the latest. I don't think anyone's done anything with it for, for quite some time. Uh, this is the final thought section. So this is not necessary. Oh, it destroyed every no, same company. Ugh. That's terrible. Um, we've got fun memories of Evernote, but yes, moved away from it. Um, final thoughts, N not necessarily MicroPython related stuff. So the Micro Mac, this is pretty interesting. Like it's someone who's built uh, an old school Mac uh, on a Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, really good write up. Um, I'll put a link in, I don't think I've got it here at the moment, but um, if you Google Micro Mac, it was quite a popular uh, article. Um, yeah, if you're not into that retro stuff, it's really cool. Uh, like emulating the actual um, old processors of the Mac. Quite nice. And this is something that caught my attention to, uh, balancing a, a, a double pendulum. Uh, I can probably show you just a quick little snippet. Um, so a double pendulum, it's really hard to listen while he's talking, but it has, it has two joints, if you will, and inherently chaotic, really difficult to actually, for a human to balance one of those things. Um, and he generates some really cool pictures. Oh, so pretty. Anyway, um, the whole thing here is like training a, a machine learning system to uh, balance one of those things uh, upright and to get it into that upright position, which before I saw this video, I wasn't even sure it was actually a solved problem. But um, it looked, the um, the animations are fantastic. All, all the infrastructure you put around how to train it was really well done. Um, and really interesting insight that he had, I guess, was that initially it was very difficult to train a machine learning mod model um, because the search space was really large. So he cranked down gravity and increased friction. And that made it much easier to train. This is an easier problem to solve. Um, and so then eventually he uh, tuned it to the regular stuff and found that it was um, was possible. And yeah, it's, it's a really cool video to watch. Um, and of course, now I want to build one. So if anyone's got, got an interest in building something like that, please let me know. Last thing is, yeah, mid journey. I thought a uh, little snake on a keyboard seemed appropriate, and this is an even weirder layout than uh, than Damien's Dvorak stuff um, because it's mid journey and it's imagined somehow. All right, that's all I've got for you. Anyone got any questions or comments or things I missed that I really should have said? Not good. Um, PyCon, that's cool. Uh, sorry, PyCon? Excited for PyCon. What's yeah. Yeah, what do you, what, what's the cool? <laughs> I, I, well, I've, I've got an idea. Uh, I guess my idea is um, uh, MicroPython, the good bits. Uh, so all the bits that I like, especially using MicroPython for, for embedded development. So um, like some of the highlights, perhaps just, even like MP Remote to use Mount to do quick iterations, um, AO REPL to do um, interactive live REPL stuff, um, the BLE side, like having AIO BLE, um, bits and pieces like that. Yeah. Well, so try to condense some of the really cool stuff that's just uh, like, I think orders of magnitude better than doing things in any other embedded language. Um, that's the little germ of an idea, but I haven't really. Yeah, uh, it's like the last one a bit though, doesn't it? A little bit, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. keeping fresh. It's, uh, they have the ugly, yeah. I to, um, yeah. I guess I've I've mentioned it a few times at work, like trying to convince, uh, I guess, the software manager that it's like, yeah, we could do some of this stuff a lot faster in Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. You know, the more sort of resources and and I don't know, evidence and whatnot like that that's out there is always a good thing. I'm yeah. Not... Andrew, you, you had um something you might want to show off. Is that ready for prime time yet or yeah, yeah. 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 It's good to go for most I'm things. Recording. Sorry? 
Pretty sure we already are. We're still, we're still recording. We're still recording. It's okay. Yeah. Um, sure. This is a little bonus one that uh, Andrew said he might be able to squeeze in tonight, but he wasn't sure he could. So, um, yeah. I don't put you under too much pressure. But... No, no. I, I've, I've got it pretty well ready to go, I think. Okay. So, is that screen sharing? Yep. So, yep. 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 So for everyone who's used to grabbing their Pico and plugging it in or some other board and plugging it in, probably fairly used to this little pattern of, okay, well, what's working? If we go MP remote and it comes up, okay, we're probably connected. Hit enter. Oh, yep, good. We've got a REPL. Then hit control D to soft reset it. And good. I right, now we've got the banner. We can see, yep, we've actually got the Pico connected like we hoped. That's all good. I've been dabbling around with the USB on these things for a long time. And like a lot of people would have originally started with an STM, like a Pi board. Not sure if anyone else noticed, but with Pi board, when you plug it in or any, indeed any STM board, plug it in, bring up MP remote and ah, the banner's just there. You've already got the banner, you've already got the ripple. It just pops straight up and you can see exactly what you've got connected and it all just looks nice and neat. There's no mucking around to see if it works. Turns out that was a feature written a very long time ago in the early days of the STM port. And it's always been a exclusive to the STMs. None of the other ports have ever, ever had that feature. In particular, all the other, pretty much every other port is based on tiny USB, which didn't have a lot of infrastructure needed to even achieve that. So that's what I've been dabbling around with. And turns out the tiny USB guys are really good at feedback and working with you and merging things, which makes it quite easy to iterate fast on here. And yet, long story short, for things like the Raspberry Pi, Pico, if you get the release build, you'll see what we just saw then, so I'm 123. But if you grab the preview build, as in build from master, grab one of them, plug it in, load it up, and do do. Uh, if, if I don't hit other keys with my fat fingers, let's just make a clean demo. Try that again. But yeah, you get the banner straight away. Happy days, very nice and fun. So especially if someone like me or Matt, who might have a bunch of different boards that you plug in at any one time, it's really nice for it to just pop up and know that you're connected to the board that you think you are when you very first turn it on, plug it in and turn it on. And so yeah, for once I'm demoing something that's actually merged on master and ready for the next release. So that's been quite exciting. It also works on, what else have I got here? If I can find a um, micro USB. So some more hardware courtesy of Matt. Is it, is it loading up? Uh, if I can leave it on. Spinny, spin, spin. Next. Oh, look at that. It's a bit tea. So yeah, Sam D works. Just same. Don't remember the port. For reference, yeah, MIMXRT. -M that's all up and running, ready to go. As is Renesas. If anyone's got a Renesas board with a USB or a Renesas dev board that you've and wired a USB cable onto, like I did. <laughs> Because for some reason, the Renaissance dev boards come with two USB ports, one of which is wired to a debugger. The other one is wired to a USB to serial converter chip to go to a UART on the main chip. The main chip's own USB isn't wired anywhere, which is <laughs> disappointing. Crazy. So yeah, we've got... Pico, SAMD, MAMXRT, and Renesas as working that way in master already. 
the support for ESP has been written or well, for the S2 and S3. And that turned out to be a rather big feature because as I mentioned earlier, tiny USB needed updates made it to support this. And by default, the ESPs use uh, hacked up, not, they use an expressive fork of tiny USB. But luckily for our users, tiny USB project does support ESP32, S2 and 3 directly through a separate driver, which is arguably more up-to-date and correct. So there's a larger PR that adds the support for ESP, S2 and 3, that also switches it over to official tiny USB library, which then should make it easy to get all that runtime USB goodness that Damien was showing off earlier, also working on the S2 and 3. Just, I keep saying that because the C series, the C3s and C6s don't have a native USB stack. They've got built-in USB, but that goes to custom hardware that only supports CDC and JTAG. So you can't run sort of generic USB stuff on that. So this feature doesn't work there and it's just like it doesn't work on traditional ESPs via UART because they don't have any way to know that something's connected, ready to do. So for devices that are via UART, you still need to do your whole control D to get your banner. But getting to the point where all the other ones with native USB, and the last one I didn't mention was that yeah, the NRF port also has it in a separate PR because it also required quite a lot of extra stuff change to support it. But yeah, that's come together quite nicely. And yeah, just one of those tiny little convenience features that then ends up being a much bigger change than you assume it will be. It's always bigger than we assume it will be. <laughs> Better development, hey? Yeah. So does that trigger an actual soft reset when you plug it in or is it just no. written? No. So, and it's only at power up. And if you've got a main.py running, then you don't get the banner anymore. What it's yeah. actually doing is keep it letting whatever's been happening in like on the REPL or on the standard out, it just keeps the last chunk of that in the USB buffer. So that like even when the USB is not connected, if the device is powered, it'll keep that in the buffer so that when your terminal, in this case MP remote, connects, it can just flush whatever is in that buffer out ready. So on a fresh board, what's in the buffer happens to be the startup banner. But if you've got code running that's doing stuff, it's whatever its last, I think by default, 512 bytes worth of standard out will be shown, that's which cool. is the same way the STM port currently works. It is just like a FIFO buffer that's keeping or caching whatever's most recently been going on. Yeah, no. There's also a slightly ulterior motive here too, is that we're trying to get um, tiny USB onto the SCM32 port. And uh, Dan Damien's made the, you know, the correct assertion that there's a few differences and there's a few things the SCM32, because it predates um, all the other ports, ha has done and it has certain features that other ports don't have. And so this is kind of removing one of those hurdles to try to get tiny USB onto the SCM32. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good thing. And the reason to get the STM port changed from the legacy STM stack to tiny USB is so that it too can get that runtime USB stuff that Damien was just demoing, the dynamic USB. So that dynamic USB stuff is all built on top of tiny USB. So it's not on the pipe border STMs at the moment until it also gets moved over to tiny USB. Yeah. And I think it's also a good glimpse as to the difficulties with making, uh, like getting consistency across ports. It's, it's a really difficult thing to do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, it also did. But 
two step forward, one step back. There was also there is still one little outstanding glitch on this that I didn't highlighted some of the things that Linux does because it always used to do it that way decades ago. Um, a little bug that Robert H. H sort of noticed and Angus investigated at great length. Some of this buffering stuff, when you plug device into Linux, every single, anytime you open a serial port on Linux, that serial port is opened in full echo mode, as in everything the device sends to the computer will get reflected back to the device. That's the default in Linux, and you kind of can't change that. It's up to software like MP Remote or it's actually Pi Serial or pretty much any other terminal that once it's opened the port to very quickly turn off Echo, otherwise standard out, gets reflected back <laughs> to standard in and gets executed. But because this happens, programming happens sequentially, port gets opened, there is some instructions run before that Echo can get turned off. There's a very tiny window, like a less than a millisecond, where echo is still on. So now that we've got data buffered, if that buffer's full and if something else writes then and happens to flush said buffer in that tiny little microsecond window, well, then whatever's being written out of the book gets reflected back to standard in. And if there's a slash n in that, it'll get executed and you end up in this weird kind of messy crap noise stuff getting blown up all over the place. Weird little bug. Turns out it can't actually be fixed on the PC side because that's what the Linux kernel does, or every serial port driver does. And you can recompile the kernel or recompile your serial drivers if you want. Um, so yeah, a little open glitch. It's it's a tiny little race condition. It's fairly hard to hit. You kind of need a main application like device running in main.py or an application main.py that's spitting out lots of messages and then crashes back to REPL so that the stuff echoed back can get executed. But yeah, it's this funny little legacy thing that Linux opens every serial port yeah. in echo mode by default. And you, you can't change it. <laughs> so that's the if comes an even bigger problem on a lot of Arduino boards because sometimes the stuff that's, it's not, it's not only opening it in echo mode, it's also opening it with like the RTS DTR lines triggered in cert, certain ways that reset Arduino boards or reset CSPs before you because they use that logic for resetting. Uh, yeah, again, you can't change that without recompiling stuff. So a lot of Arduino boards, when you open them, they get they reset every time on Linux, not on Windows, only on Linux. Little funny legacy stuff. But yeah, we'll work on fixing that glitch. I know Angus has been looking into it. It may require some more changes, a tiny USB to support pausing, like just making sure nothing can get sent down the serial port until the port's finished being opened with a delay. Fun games. Ooh. That's deep in the weeds. 